So good afternoon um, and welcome to the archives of the American Jewish Historical Society for Live from the Archives. This is a Zoom series that allows us to highlight objects and documents that tell the story of Jews in America. Today we're going to focus on the issue, focus on the topic of GI Jew soldiers in World War II. Now we're doing this because when we offered this as one of the 30 possible subjects, this was voted one of the, of the, one of the most popular, I think the most popular of the subjects by our newsletter audience of thousands. Um, and so we're bringing it to you, but with a little bit of a historical perspective, I wanted to point out that when the American Jewish Historical Society was founded, they too were interested in, in Jewish military service. Now, AJHS was founded in 1892, so this is of course well before World War II or World War I, um, but the early publications of the American Jewish Historical Society looked at Jewish military involvement in the Revolutionary War and the Civil War in part because they wanted to dispel a, a, a stereotype that Jews didn't serve in war. So they went back and they showed. So there would be articles like Jewish soldiers or articles like the documents related to the career of Colonel Isaacs. So all of these kind of um, publications showed various ways in which Jews served in the American military. So for the early founders of the American Jewish Historical Society, this was a way of showing Jews were indeed American at a time that their American identity was sometimes questioned. I'm curious today to ask you why you are so interested in GI Jews and specifically the GI Jews of World War II. So I'd love for you to take a moment and write into the chat um, and tell us why this was of interest to you. Um, and hopefully we'll get to that in this program. And if not, this is live from the archives. So at the very end of our segment, I will be here along with our Director of Collections, Melanie Myers, to answer questions that come up during the, um, during the show. Um, so the topic at hand, Jewish GIs in World War II, over 500,000 Jewish GIs served. Um, and this was really important because um, what it meant is that Jews from diverse areas were coming together um, in new ways. So before World War II, or at the time of World War II, up to 50% of Jews lived in either New York or Chicago, and then really we're talking about Brooklyn and the Bronx. And then with army service and being mixed into different um, camps and regiments with people from all over the country, including Jews from all over the country, you have small town Jews and big city Jews meeting each other. You have reform, you have orthodox, you have secular, you have Zionist. All of these distinctions, um, all of these varieties were part of the Jewish GI population, but in a way they didn't matter in the army because the army just saw you as a Jew, not as a secular Jew, a cultural Jew or this. And so there was this way in which Jews were coming together in very interesting ways um, that they hadn't before. Um, and the historian Deborah Dash Moore, who we're going to hear from more uh, as we go through the show, um, talks about how this was a time that there had never been this kind of cohesiveness among American Jews before. So our show will, will look a little bit at why that's the case. I also want to quote another historian, Lucy Davidovich, whose papers we have here in our archive, who wrote um, early on that this was a transformative experience, not just for the soldiers themselves, but also for all American Jews. Because every American Jewish family knew someone, had someone in their family, a close relative who went to war. About 11% of American Jews fought in the war. And so we're looking at about 50% um, of all of those men between the ages of 18 and, and 40. So a huge population went to serve, um, and we're going to learn about them, we're going to learn about the chaplains who served them, and we're going to learn about how this experience transformed the American Jewish community. Many, many American Jews served, roughly 50% of those eligible, which is a very high percentage, much more than the average for Americans. Now, in part, that's due to the fact that Jews did not work in those kinds of industries like farming or indeed heavy industry um, where you got exemptions, right? Uh, because you were needed for the war effort. Um, it also is in part because many Jews delayed marriage. So um, they might be 19, 20, 21, whatever, and they weren't married and that made them even more eligible. But it's also because American Jews were eager to serve. They rushed into military service um, because they saw this as a war against Nazi Germany. 
when they get into the military, they discover that their fellow soldiers think it's a war mostly about Japan. That's what they're going to war for, to avenge Pearl Harbor, not to fight Nazi racism, Nazi Germany. So it, it, the war for Jews is slightly different than the war for other Americans. They're enthusiastic, um, they enlist, they're out there in the military in all of these different branches of the service, but they're having a different kind of experience than other Americans. And they become pretty conscious of where it differs um, because they start talking to their fellow um, uh, GIs and they realize that things that they had taken for granted are not shared by them. So today we are going to discuss some of the archival holdings at the American Jewish Historical Society which shed light on Jewish participation in the armed forces particularly during World War II. This uh, large box of index cards is part of the collection of the National Jewish Welfare Board. The NJWB is the second largest collection at the American Jewish Historical Society. Its four parts comprise uh, close to 2,000 linear feet, making it an exceptionally large archival collection. And the NJWB was founded in 1917 specifically to address um, concerns and issues related to Jewish soldier, soldiers in World War I. Um, in the interwar years, they concentrated on other community activities, but the infrastructure they had built to assist soldiers during World War I was then incredibly effective during World War II when there was a huge influx of Jewish GIs into the American Armed Forces. Um, among the other tasks that they did, they provided kosher food to GIs, they were instrumental in deploying unprecedented amounts of Jewish chaplains into the field to provide services and minister to the Jewish soldiers. They also kept detailed records, um, over 88,000 records composed on these individual index cards, which um, provide vital information about the Jewish service people in uh, serving in the armed forces in World War II. So uh, I also want to talk a little bit about what is actually contained on these cards and what kind of information was being collected by the NJWB and by who. Um, a lot of this was collected through um, various NJWB community organizations. They were getting this information from families. Some of it they got out of newspaper articles talking about people um, coming home from the war, being decorated, meritorious service, sadly, when um, individuals also died in war. And they employed a variety of notations in order to sort the data. And they modeled these on the IBM type punch cards. And you can see, obviously, from the side here that they have the holes in the side in order to uh, better collate and organize the information. And so you can see some of the things that they have noted here. We have uh, Kenneth Morris. It has um, his next of kin. His, uh, his rank, he was a private first class, it would appear. He was in the army. Um, what the date of inquiry was, which means the date that evidently the NJWB received this information, this card does not say authenticated. So that means that this information was just received from the family and it was not verified by the NJWB. Sometimes they could not verify this information. Sometimes they just didn't um, necessarily have the time to do so. But so that's what one of these cards looks like and that's the kind of notations. But there's another kind of card here that is probably the root of um, the vast majority of reference questions that we have received at both AJ, at AJHS over the years. And it has to do with a card like this, which has a hole punched in the corner. So um, most of these cards were um, digitized by Ancestry many years ago, and they are available to be viewed via Ancestry. And we frequently get individuals emailing and saying, so I found this card on Ancestry uh, looking for my grandfather, my uncle, whoever, their war service, and um, we didn't realize we were Jewish and we're confused. And um, could you tell us a little more about why this ended up in the NJWB? And the answer is, um, this was an imperfect information gathering process. They were trying to gather as much information as they could, as quickly as they possibly could. And so sometimes um, there were non-Jewish soldiers that got mixed in. And so you can see that this card says it's authenticated, which means that someone checked the information. And if it had a hole punched in the corner, that means that uh, the soldier was actually indeed not Jewish. So. Um, frequently it is my job to email people and tell people I'm very sorry to tell you but you are actually not uh, your, your family member was not indeed Jewish but um, that is and that is some of the, the information that they would put on these cards you can also see here 
Um, this person was held prisoner. Um, frequently there are notations of Purple Hearts, uh, Navy Crosses, all of the various decorations that were given out by the Army and Navy. And these cards are also heavily weighted towards Army and Navy participation. There's not nearly as much in terms of the Marines or the Air Force that is notated in these cards. Yeah. One of the wonderful things about AJHS is that we are a multi-format collection. So that means that we collect materials um, that inhabit a variety of physical forms. We have a large library. As you've seen from both this episode and the episode before, we have an extremely large archival component, but we also have a lot of what we call museum objects, which are objects that have been donated here um, by themselves as freestanding objects, but also that frequently come as part of archival collections. And um, one of the archival collections we received here in the last uh, 10 years or so is that of the Klinghoffer family. Um, many of you may know uh, the name Leon Klinghoffer, who uh, sadly perished in the Achille Loro hijacking terrorism incident. But what most people also don't know about Leon Klinghoffer is that Leon Klinghoffer served in World War II. And one of the wonderful things that his family donated when they brought in his archive is they brought in his dog tags. These are Leon Klinghoffer's dog tags from World War II. Um, there, it's a little hard to read the writing, um, but you can see there Leon Klinghoffer. You can see the H on the tag, which stands for Hebrew, to note that he was um, of the Jewish faith and uh, Mr. Klinghoffer also attached a small mezuzah to his tags as well, um, while he was wearing them during World War II. Now, why would a Jew uh, in the military wear, wear a mezuzah? Right? Well, because it was supposed to bring you good luck. Um, Catholics wore, you know, St. Christopher medals for good luck. Jews put on a mezuzah, not all of them, of course, but a lot of them. Now, Klinghoffer was in the European theater, 93rd Bombardment, and that meant that he was flying over German territory, Nazi territory. So one of the things that flyers um, had to decide is do they wear their dog tag with the H? And why did they have to decide that? Because they knew that they would not necessarily be treated as prisoners of war if they were captured, if they were shot down and were captured by the Germans. Um, and they worried about it. And they debated. And some flyers always wore their dog tags because they said, if, if uh, I'm shot down, I want the Germans to know it was a Jew up there who was dropping the bombs. Other flyers took them off. They had two sets. They had one they wore regularly and one they would wear to fly. And they, uh, usually the one they wore to fly had a P on it, Protestant. Because uh, they didn't want to take a chance of mistreatment or in fact just being murdered right? and not treated as taken prisoner of war. It, it was a real issue um, for, for Jews um, in the European theater. It was obviously not an issue in the Pacific theater. So in addition to the cards, another large component of the NJWB collection has to do with their deployment of chaplains in World War II um, to minister to the soldiers who were out in the field and to conduct field services. Um, the NJWB deployed over 600 chaplains during World War II to uh, distribute kosher food, to distribute prayer books, which were written in World War I um, with the agreement of reform, orthodox, and conservative rabbis to be distributed to soldiers in the field. But the NJWB also had their chaplains fill out their own questionnaires. And unlike the cards, which were drawn frequently from external forces, not filled out by the soldiers themselves, these questionnaires were filled out by the chaplains. And you can see here the chaplain questionnaire for Roland Gittleson, who gave the famous sermon at Iwo Jima. There's his picture right there. And you can see this is filled out in his own hand his place of birth, Cleveland, Ohio, um, his wife, Ruth, born, uh, married on September 25th, uh, 1932. So he was married and had two young children at the time when he was deployed into the Pacific Theater. Um, there's many pages to Chaplain Gittleson's, uh, to Rabbi Gittleson's page here, um, his educational history. Um, originally uh, came from Cincinnati, Ohio, and then became the rabbi at the Central Synagogue of Nassau County. So at the time that he was deployed, 
um, to the Pacific Theater. He and his family were residing in Long Island. And you can see the information that they gather here. What secular organizations are you affiliated with? Um, they ask people to discuss their civilian life as well, but it also contains um, what branch of the service they are in. He was Navy, attached to the Marine Corps, actually at that point, his serial number, um, and the various places he was deployed. He was originally deployed, it would appear, in the San Diego area, which is most likely how he ended up spending his, um, his military career largely in the Pacific Theater. He was deployed with the 5th Marine Division. Um, and he also received the Navy letter and ribbon of commendation for the campaign at Iwo Jima, which was um, an incredibly bloody and difficult battle fought in the Pacific Theater during World War II. Now we'll come to another very important piece here. Okay, and that is Judaism, as compared to Jews, Judaism, a religion, is accepted by the military as one of the three fighting faiths of democracy alongside Protestantism and Catholicism. That is an extremely important change that occurs. So even as these men, these Jewish GIs, are struggling to gain the respect of their fellow GIs, the military is saying Judaism is, is important. We're going to build chapels on, on uh, military bases without any religious insignia. So Jews can use them and Catholics can use them and Protestants could use them. We're going to give Jews time off for their, to observe their, their holidays. You know, especially once you, when you're stateside before you go ship overseas. Um, we're going to accept Judaism as, as one of the important upholders of democracy. Um, and we're going to see it as a crucial component of something that gets really, if not invented, then certainly expanded in the uh, in World War II by the military, something called the Judeo-Christian tradition. That is understood to be the democratic fighting tradition of the United States. That tradition becomes exemplified in the story of the USS Dorchester. So the USS Dorchester was a troop ship um, it was carrying uh, over 700 men um, going through the North Atlantic in February of 1942, trying to, to bring troops over to uh, Britain. And it's torpedoed by the Germans. There are four chaplains on the troop ship, um, two Protestants, one a liturgical Protestant and one an evangelical Protestant, a Catholic and a Jewish rabbi. Because chaplains are officers, chaplains were billeted up above, you know, above decks, whereas all the men were below decks. So when the ship starts to sink, as it does when the torpedo hits, the men from below the desk start to come up in order to get off of the, of the ship. And the four chaplains make a decision they're going to hand to the men life, you know, um, um, uh, life preservers, gloves, because the, the North Atlantic is very, very cold. You know, all of the things that they need and as they get into the, the, sh the uh, lifeboats, right? And then they hand them their own life vests and their own gloves and the four of them decide to go down with the ship. So they link arms and they pray. The Protestants pray in English. The Catholic prays in Latin because in those days, Catholics did everything in Latin. And the rabbi prays in Hebrew and they go down together. So the four chaplains become sort of an exemplar of just what America stands for. Ah, you got that picture. Okay, thank you, Annie. Um, they're later made into a, um, 
uh, a postage stamp, right? And there is a chapel devoted to the four uh, chaplains. I want to speak a little bit more now about the role of chaplains because chaplains had to mediate. Um, they, they represented um, Judaism, which was respected, but they were also obviously Jews. Um, and Jews weren't completely respected. <laughs> Um, and so they had to work to try to gain respect for Jews using their identity as chaplains. So one of the ways we can look at how Judaism played out during World War II is to look at some of the objects in our collections, specifically the kits that chaplains would carry with them. Now these would be boxes in which um, chaplains would have, if they were a Jewish chaplain, they would have Sabbath candlesticks, they would have a kiddush cup. Um, in order to set up a ceremony, they would have or set up a service. There was a Ten Commandments that they could set up like this. And they also had flags um, or kind of fabric that I'm gonna show you. And again, the Ten Commandments with the Star of David over it. And this would be set up on the field um, so that services could happen um wherever you were right as long as you had this box with you as long as you had a chaplain with you and as long as you had jews to come together to pray now of course really important to this endeavor it would be prayer books and as mentioned before um the jewish welfare board created prayer books they updated prayer books um, that had been created in world war one so there would be prayer books for daily use and also prayer books for special holidays in particular um, the jewish new year and yom kippur the day of atonement so we can see here a prayer book for the Day of Atonement, that's for Jews and the armed forces of the United States. This was in 1941 and also reissued in 1943. And this is an abridged prayer book that was used in um, daily practice. And this was donated to us by a soldier named Samuel Stein. And you can see the inscription here. Um, the, the regiment was in uh, Truox Field in, in Wisconsin, right outside of Madison. Um, and in here, there's a prayer for country. That's interesting. And also just looking at the preface, the preface, it says, may this prayer book small enough in size to be carried in a pocket over the heart, bear the spiritual message of Israel's ancient prayers to the heart of the American Jewish soldiers and sailors serving their country. The prayers here gathered together speak of the eternal aspirations of the Jewish people and indeed of all mankind. They lift the soul above the immediate cares and interests of the daily round to the sphere of tenderness, purity, and faith that is divine. They link those far from home with some of the most beautiful and uplifting associations of family life. They quicken loyalty to loved ones and to all one's fellow men. They strengthen against temptation and give courage to spurn evil and hold fast to faith in the ultimate triumph of the good. In furthering this high purpose, this little volume of devotion serves not only the men who use it, but also the highest ideal of America. So it's really clear in these prayer books and the way in which the Jewish chaplains organized, the National Jewish Welfare Board organized, that being Jewish was being American. It was not one or the other. And in serving, one could practice one's Judaism and be a soldier and it all flowed together, at least in an ideal sense. And there are examples of um, how this played out in real time. So one example that comes to mind also from Deborah Dash Moore's book, G.I. Jews, um, was of a ship that the National Jewish Welfare Board had sent Passover supplies. Now on the ship, there was no Jewish chaplain. And so um, one of the officers found, or one of the, you know, one of the, um, leaders found two Jewish officers and said, you're in charge of a Passover Seder. And they're like, what do we know about a Passover Seder? We don't know how to lead it. So they actually asked the chaplain that was Episcopalian if he could lead the Seder because they knew that he knew Hebrew. And he said, sure. And so on board this ship with the supplies, with the matzah, with the wine, with the Passover Haggadah sent to them from the National Jewish Welfare Board, an Episcopalian chaplain led Jewish men and also people who came to observe the Passover Seder together. So that's one example of kind of different faiths coming together to create a Jewish ritual. On the reverse, um, on Christmas, what would often happen is Jewish soldiers would sign up for jobs or for duties so as to free Christian soldiers um, so that they could celebrate and observe their holiday. So we can see how like in practice on a day-to-day -day level and as seasons came and went, that the army worked to kind of, um, to allow 
religious uh, observance and how that was almost a communal effort. Um, and the chaplains were also supposed to serve people who weren't just of their own background. So um, Jewish chaplains or Protestant chaplains or Catholic chaplains were given a daily or not daily, a monthly questionnaire. And one of the questions was, have you helped someone, a soldier who is not of your faith? So that was, that was something that was written in as Deborah Dashmore would talk about as standard operating procedure um, during World War II. And these objects, these prayer books kind of uh, give testament to that. Jewish GIs come back to the United States and they are indeed changed by this war. Um, they're, they're on the one hand much more comfortable with non-Jews. They've been living with them. They've been fighting together with them. They've come to know non-Jews um, intimately. Right? And on the other hand, they are trained and ready to fight. And what you get as a result of this, in the, right after the war, is that Jews develop an aggressive program to change the character of American society. You learn about civil rights, and sometimes they say it doesn't begin until the 50s, which isn't true. It starts after the war. African-American soldiers, who, even though they've been um, segregated, also come back feeling, you know, they risk their lives and they want changes. So you start to get these changes um, that are pressed for. And often Jewish soldiers will put on their uniforms, right? right? And if they have any, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 medals or whatever, they will um, uh, walk up to, to hotels and they say, what do you mean you, you won't let a Jew in, right? I fought to protect this country, right? Um, you should open those doors. Um, they bring court cases um, against residential discrimination to the Supreme Court that changes. They um, threaten a university like Columbia with uh, losing its accreditation if it doesn't um, uh, get rid of quotas against Jews. So they become far more aggressive in seeking to create the kind of vision for a society that they have and that you will hear when you start to read um, uh, Gittleson's uh, sermon. Hi. <laughs> Hi. So um, I'm Annie Pond, the executive director, and uh, this is Melanie Myers. You've seen us throughout the last 30 minutes. Um, and we are here to answer your questions. Before we go into questions, um, one of the things I noticed throughout the show as you were writing into the chat, um, you did that very beautifully. I asked, why are you, why are you so interested in this? And um, was really heartened to see all the responses, like the, the, your responses kept popping up you know, very, very quickly. And so many of them had to do with the fact that you had family members who had served in World War II, right? So that these were stories that were not just something you read about in a history book, but that you learned about at home. And we're really curious to hear more about that. And it actually sparked me to think about my own family. Um, my grandfather, Harry Sheinfeld, uh, was a sergeant in um, World War II, and I remember I was lucky enough to um, have him with me through much of my life. Um, my grandparents were young when I was born, fairly young, and so when when I had to go to his funeral uh, in like 2001, I remember walking into the Reformed Temple, but then also seeing the coffin covered with the with the American flag and realizing that connection and seeing that really since that synthesis that was so evident in his life about being both an American, a soldier, and a Jew. And then at the end of the ceremony, I'll never forget how moved I was um, walking out of the sanctuary. Uh, the Lubavitch rabbi of Milwaukee, who knew my grandfather, um, had come. And this was not, this usually didn't happen where you'd have an Orthodox uh, of that um, a rabbi come to the reform service. It was so different, but he came to pay his respects. And I think that was also something that we hear a lot about, how Jews of 
various denominations kind of come together in World War II. And that was something that lived with my grandfather um, throughout his life. So sorry to diverge with my own story, but it was just something that occurred to me as, as this was happening. And I imagine that many of you have similar stories. Um, Deborah Dashmore at that very end mentioned Roland Gittleson. And um, uh, someone I also noticed had been a, a congregant of the congregation who served in Boston for so many years. He also, by the way, Roland Gittleson would, would write. We, our library is actually filled with books of his sermons. And this was something he wrote after the war on modern Jewish problems that was actually geared to teenagers, Jewish teenagers. Um, so these men come out of the war and they have this commitment to, um, to uh, a much broader community. But I wanted to quote very quickly from his sermon that he gives in Iwo, uh, after Iwo Jima when they are dedicating the cemetery um, where all these men have fought, um, many thousands had died, and Roland Gittleson was invited to give a sermon when they finally were uh, dedicating a, a, a cemetery. And it was supposed to be an interdenominational uh, service. And the head Protestant chaplain invites Roland Gittleson to give the sermon. But what happens, um, sadly, is that there were other Protestant chaplains who said, why should a Jewish person, you know, Jews are such a minority, why should a rabbi lead this service? And then Catholics, some Catholic chaplains said the same thing. And so Roland Gittleson ended up writing this beautiful sermon, but delivering it to just the Jewish uh, servicemen. And however, the Protestant chaplains who wanted him to deliver it to everyone attended, they heard his sermon and had it distributed throughout. And it was printed in stateside in the newspapers forever. And I, I'm just going to read a little tiny bit of it because I think that the sentiment that he expresses is one that we're still dealing with in this country. But he writes, um, anyone among us, the living, who fails to understand will thereby betray those who lie here. Whoever of us lifts his hand in hate against another or thinks himself superior to those who happen to be in the minority makes of this ceremony and of the bloody sacrifice it commemorates an empty hollow mockery. To this, them, as our solemn sacred duty, do we, the living, now dedicate ourselves to the right Protestants, Catholics, and Jews of all races alike to enjoy the democracy for which all of them he have here paid the price. Um, so in some ways, the sermon was viewed as controversial at the time because he talked a lot about inequality and the importance of, of, of changing and getting rid of inequality and of continuing to keep fighting for a fuller expression of democracy. So these words are still with us today and I think still really relevant. So I wanted to make sure we put that in as part of this. Um, and we'll be giving you a longer list of resources so you can look in more. But I also wanted to be able to turn to Melanie and have Melanie tell you a little bit more about the collections that we have. So Melanie, you had been saying to me that there was something really moving about looking at these cards and seeing the handwriting on them. And I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that and also tell us why this collection of cards is so important in the archive, in the larger archive world. Um, well, first to address the uh, the collections of cards, and of course I have a I have my box sitting right here on my desk um, where I can look at it. But part of the reason why these cards are so important and so utilized by researchers has to do with something that did not happen at the American Jewish Historical Society, but happened at the National Archives in 1973, which was at one of the large National Archives um, related warehouses that housed an enormous amount of people's wartime records suffered an absolutely catastrophic fire. And there's a lot of information on the actual National Archives website about this, where they describe what happens in great detail. But the upshot of it is that um, a huge amount of people's wartime records from, uh, I want to say, like 1916, particularly to like the 1950s, um, were virtually uh, were uh, either destroyed or were terribly water damaged. The fire burned for two days. It was, um, it was really an incredible loss. The archivist of the United States said that it was an enormous amount of cultural heritage material that was lost. So for, um, and while the National Archives and the Veterans Administrations were able to largely sort of um, reassemble the details of people's service from other, from other different sources, they can't, um, you can't really ever reconstruct the paper file itself that was destroyed. So for many people that come here to look at these, these paper index cards may be one of the only, um, paper documents that was generated in that time period that document your loved one's war service. 
Um, and there's something really powerful, and that goes back to the first question that you asked me, but there really is power in looking at these documents and handling them, um, knowing why they were created and who created them. And I got very choked up looking at Rabbi Gittleston's file. I'm getting choked up just talking about it now. Because um, again, to see, you know, these are the, the bravery, and really it's, um, it's just amazing to me. And, uh, and it really just makes me feel very privileged to work here and get to work with these stories and to tell these stories. How would people who are watching, if they want to find out if so many of them have relatives who served in World War II, um, how would they find, be able to find out if we have a card that marks um, their, their own relatives? Well, you can always email uh, us here at the AJHS. We field reference questions every day. And also um, our colleagues that uh, work in the reference department at the Center for Jewish History can help with that as well. The cards have also been digitized via Ancestry. And while you have to pay for Ancestry, you can also usually get a free trial. Um, so you can at least uh, go through some of the records there. Um, but the one thing I do want to caution people about is out of the, um, out of the enormous amount of um, Jewish people who served in the armed forces, um, this collection only documents some. We, um, it does not document all half a million um, Jewish individuals who served in World War II. So. But feel free to email us and ask, and we are happy to look. We are happy to look up a card. Or um, if you had a relative who was a chaplain, we are also happy to look up the chaplain files and see what we have. And I also noticed that we have um, with us today Rabbi Irv Elson from the Jewish Welfare Board, and he made the point that I think is important still that to this day it's serving Jews of all denominations and backgrounds and chaplains of all uh, denominations. So um, thank you so much for being uh, with us today, and we'd love to hear more of, of the stories and the work that you're doing. Um, there was another question, too, about um, how many women served in World War II or how many specifically how many Jewish women. I actually don't know that number. I think it would be less than 50,000. Um, but one of the other things I noticed too is that some of you have been posting about diaries and interviews you've done with Jewish women. That is something that we don't have a lot about, uh, a lot of in our archive. We think some of the cards reference some of the Jewish women who went, so we're gonna look through that. But if you have material about Jewish women who served in World War II, we would, we would love to learn more about this. Um, so please be in touch with us. Um, and I think um, our email is, well, I know our email is, is info at ajhs.org. And Melanie's email is mmyers at ajhs.org. Mine is apolland at ajhs.org. Um, so we're so thrilled that so many of you were able to join us today and also a big uh, shout out to those of you who might be watching us at a later date on, on Facebook Live and also we'll be storing these on our website. We will be able to close caption the recording. So I apologize that we have not yet been able to do that for the live. We just are a very small, small crew, but we're working on it. Um, and I want to do a huge shout out to uh, Chelsea Bracci who made all of this happen. <laughs> Um, also to thank Deborah Dashmore, um, the wonderful historian whose book, G.I. Jews, is a must read. So we'll also be posting very soon a list of additional references for you to read, be in touch with us, and um, join us next time as we actually learn about uh, an 1815 ivory miniature of a woman named Sarah Brandon Moses and learn about her fascinating history that's just been recently uncovered. Um, so again, keep, uh, keep in touch and we hope to see you uh, in future episodes and have a, have a good day.